Hello guys, welcome back to the channel. Eugene Kazins here today. And I'm gonna be talking about the categories of paramotors. And the reason why I think it's kind of important to, to put paramotors within categories is because a lot of pilots don't realize that uh, the owners or designers of products usually had some form of inspiration where they uh, wanted the paramotor to perform in a really good way in some style of flying. So uh, I don't really believe in the multi-tool concept. Like I said, it's about uh, one paramotor being able to do everything. So let's just rationalize ourselves through that. Uh, Adam 80 with a low out, uh, engine output is not necessarily going to be a very good choice as a slalom racing machine simply because in slalom you want a high output engine to and a heavy wing load uh, um, wing load isn't uh, isn't a bad thing because you're going to be flying a tiny glider you're trying to get max speed and you're flying for short durations uh, of time so with a low output you're going to struggle to get those tiny wings in the air although we do sometimes talk about power to weight and we'll get to that in a minute um, it's a very rational concept for you to be able to understand that uh, not every engine and every frame is best designed for all possible uses so what are the uses the categories that I put them in and you have to understand that I'm doing this from uh, the, the the viewpoint of a instructor so I'm wearing my instructor hat today I'm not wearing my Nirvana or Dudek hat and I'm specifically talking about what's best for your style of life I represent more than about 270 pilots through the combined club partnerships and the school that services those clubs is the Nirvana Aero School and we have instructors that have to sign an agreement and then they can be part of this training organization and basically the agreement one of the points in the agreement is that you're not allowed to make a student feel bad about whatever his purchase was so if a student doesn't have faith in his equipment then he's going to have a hard time to be trained to get in the air so you're not allowed to pass comment about well you bought the wrong machine you should have bought that machine that's you know it's a very very important point to make someone feel proud about his gear in order for him to have faith in it what i would try and um uh try and, and motivate instructors to do is to point out the differences so that that specific student is better prepared for whatever the possible uses is going to be so for example if you're going to have a higher fuel consumption because you are intending to use your machine for cross-country flying at very fast speeds but you know that your engine the instructor has told you that the engine unit is going to give you a certain fuel consumption that is higher than average or something like that then you can just better plan for that by doing more stops planning more stops along the way or you can fly slower or you can add more fuel tank capacity through a bladder tank etc you see what i mean it's not necessarily a negative point it is more about preparing the student by sharing proper information. I've met so many people in the industry that bought a piece of kit that have come to me and said, well, I thought that, you know, I'm, I'm sitting with this problem that I cannot fly this cross country event with you simply because I cannot make the flight leg. And then it's about me said, no, no, you can. It's about me saying you can do it, but we're gonna have to prepare you for it. It's not necessarily a bad thing. All right, so made my, my point there. Different categories. Sports flying, cross country flying, slalom flying, acro flying can, is, is, all, is, is very much a, a category where a multitude of machines would do well. Um, and it's a very highly skilled uh, set of uh, pilots there that, that, that function in that category. So I'm not really going to talk about that. So let's talk about sport flying. That is the largest portion of pilots in paramotoring um, function within the, uh, or, or, or by machines for the purpose of sport flying. Sport flying, let's, if we had to define it, is one to two hours worth of flying. Guys that want to have fun by flying with their friends, do a bit of sightseeing, uh, enjoy hard climbs and a little bit of twists and turns, flying very low along river creeks and things like that. So you'd like a nice burst of, of, of power on your machine, so you like a, a good amount of power. And while we're on the point of power and with sport flying, what is enough power? Enough power in the right, to, to categorize, define it the right way, is if you're on speed by and you've got a slight bit of climb then you know you've you've got the right amount of power for the wing that you are flying so a, sli a slight bit of climb rate is required when you're on f f full speed bar then you've got the right size wing and the right size power for your body weight the power to weight has been sorted out so in sport category um, machines do not necessarily can have more failures um, technical failures because you're most likely flying around 
um, sport fields, club fields, um, as opposed to flying over the Amazon for 1,000 kilometers without a possible landing zone. You see what I'm saying? It is, that's what, where sport flying is more um, of a recreational activity and less of a super adventurous activity. All right, cross-country flying is very different in the sense that in cross-country flying, you're going to be pushing uh, two to five, six, seven, eight hours worth of flying without landing. Um, and sometimes it would include landing just to refuel and take off again, depending on the speeds that you're flying. You would, you would prioritize fuel consumption over power to a certain extent, but not you don't want to sacrifice it completely um, because a cross-country flying these days is more defined about the very fast wings, being able to fly from A to B as quickly as possible because you're flying in the best, the best weather of the day. You can do cross-country flying very slow um, and it's not a negative thing if you do it that way, but you do have to realize that there are pros and cons to that. Flying slow and being caught in the middle of the day is more thermals, therefore your machine needs to, uh, the, you're going to have a bit more discomfort flying in the middle of the day and your level of comfort you know that you did you feel comf comfortable with those types of conditions is affected all right so that's sport class flying we're going to get into details here with the two machines behind me all right so let's get into the machines and <clears throat> what makes them very good for certain categories so swing arms is one of those I would say prerequisites for sport flying. It's it's more purposefully built for sport flying, if you ask me, because of weight shifting. Now, as I've illustrated in that video, or going to illustrate in that video, um, leading one side is both a ca uh, uh, anti torque means of countering torque, but it's also weight weight shifting is also a very nice, playful experience. So the majority of pilots appreciate. Um, I appreciate weight shifting as an ability, whereas cross-country pilots are the opposite. They don't want the weight shifting, and also photographers don't want weight shifting, simply because if you're leaning out of your seat in whatever whatever direction, you want the machine to still fly um, a normal direction, and also control uh, input is only determined by the pilot by using the toggles. So that's in the cross-country side. But the swing arms is incredibly important, and this, for example, the shape of it um, has been uh, on the increase, and in, it's a very good design on the, on the power jet. So you've got these hook in points, which are slightly shifted in opposite directions, um, and basically what you have, what you get from that, is power jet means of compensating for torque. Now. A torque is something to cater for. You've got a, you get a lot of brands where the guy goes full throttle on takeoff and the machine twists on his back. That's a less desirable system to, to be flying with. And I think that the Parajet has got um, pretty good anti-torque, especially from um, <clears throat> the takeoff position. It doesn't look that weird at all. And I found it enjoyable as a takeoff platform. I didn't find it uncomfortable at all. So pretty good design uh, for sport flying in that sense. Harness made by Dudek, very comfortable when you're in the seat and you're flying somewhere. I can see the appeal with the Parajet simply because it's such a comfortable platform to fly. Got good padding on the harness as well. As you can see, it's a pretty simple design. It's titanium bars. They've cut down on weight, and that is what started the revolution in the lightweight uh, paramotor section because uh, so flying something that is light is easy to improve upon for power to weight ratio. So the, the Vitarazi coupled with a lightweight frame and harness and whole complete unit uh, gave pilots for the first time in the uh, uh, in paramotoring something where you could uh, improve on the power to weight and get off the ground quicker and have a more uh, manageable experience when you're walking around with equipment and also if you had to fly somewhere and pack a little bit more th items that you want to fly with you're not completely overweight when you uh, fly a piece of kit like that so um 24 kilos for this machine uh, now it's got dual start in the sense of pull start and, and um, electric start and a lipo battery as well so uh, this has also got a 25 liter fuel tank which is the skunk works tank part of the reason why i wanted to show this uh, this specific unit in this video is because this machine has been adapted for cross-country flying um, and if you add all these items the machine becomes a bit more heavy because it now has a more functions built into it and more function just means more weight with a frame, you've got, it stands on its frame and therefore it's a very strong, 
very strong stable um, platform to stand somewhere to be to be uh, you know to travel with so I like the fact that the machine has that the negative part of having that is because of it sitting so high above your seat is that it'll catch your calf sometimes if you're running and you're overextending your legs that is something that can catch you with that frame design the pro again is that it is more resistant to damage if you're going to hit the ground because it's less flexible Okay, so there are pros and cons to every element that you put on a paramotor. Uh, when we talk about the engine, uh, the, the Viterazzi, um, the most of Viterazzi 185 is the most common engine used. I think so, you know, I, I don't have the specific stats on it, but it is a very widely used engine used and very popular. And the only point I'm going to really ex um, uh, enunciate with this concept, with this engine, is the fact that if you're using a smaller engine, that you are trying to get more power out because you're improving, you're trying to improve the power to weight by making the engine lighter as well. Um, <clears throat> then you have to accept the fact that if you're going to run something harder than a normal higher displacement engine, that it's going to be a bit more sensitive. Flying any engine harder means that it's working uh, at higher temperatures, it's operating at higher temperatures. So this specific engine, you've got to make sure that your carburetor settings are correct. And there are also, if you have a, an instructor or a dealer, they can give you proper information about the, the heating, the, the warm-up process of your engine before you start flying it, I think it's important to 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 make use of that. An uh, engine is only as good as the pilot that flies it. If you know that there are certain shortcomings, then you can plan for it and you can make sure that you get longevity out of it. So you'll see some social media posts with um, exhaust cracks on the Viterazzi. Um, and my five cents worth of, and this is by no means is gospel, is the fact that because you're running a clutch and because you know we can fly in cold temperatures, you know, you know not every place is tropical like where I come, I come from, but if you're flying in, in colder temperatures and you're running these engines so hot that it's over, it's, it's heated with the process of uh, the, the, the hot ex uh, engine gases coming through there. And then you go over and start playing. And if it's wet conditions or it's raining or something like, not raining, but it's, it's moist conditions. And now you start super cooling that exhaust. Um, then that, that's not good for any metal. So that over a period of time and operating hours that could possibly be a negative element that comes into it so i'm not saying that the clutch and the exhaust combination is necessarily a negative thing it's just something that you have to cater for or plan for that if you be noticeable of it that, that could possibly part of the be part of the reason why some of the exhausts are not doing as well now Verazzi has tried to solve that and they've, they're fixing it and they're improving it over time there's been different very different versions of the exhaust that have come out of time there's third party manufacturers of it I'm not going to hop on it I think that uh, use of the machine how you use it and um, planning ahead for the sensitivities of the specific motor will ensure the longevity that you don't have malfunctions on it um, that's pretty much everything I'm going to say about it. Um, what else can I say on this system? I do think that, you know, after using it a bit and understanding that it could possibly flood if you over prime the engine here with the primer here, you could over flood the, you, the, 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 the cylinder chamber. Um, and basically because the, of the, how the engine sits, the fuel cannot run out of the air filter. Whereas I'm going to show you on the Nirvana, that is something that is very different. Sometimes the Nirvana starts a bit harder because you have to push the air out of the, the, the fuel line. And if you're not aware of that, that could be a problem for you. In my experience, I think the Viterazzi starts very easy. I think it's a very simple engine. If you know how to use it, again, it's about how the pilot uses it. If you're going to do your priming and your startup sequence incorrectly, then it's going to be a nightmare. But if you do it correct, I think this engine is very reliable on the start. So I don't have anything negative to say about that. All right. Um, the fuel tank, the 25 liter fuel tank. <clears throat> Let's talk about that. So this is a Skunk Works tank, sorry for the sun is now, and I'm going to be in the shade to show you this, the exhaust and the 25 liter fuel tank. And I'm going to get back out of the sun, out of the shade. Uh, this, you, from Vitaraz, you're going to get a standard 10 liter tank, but then you can get a 15 liter extended tank for longer durations of flight. And the Skunk Works tank was made by the importer here in South Africa. Very good, very excellent pilot. And with that extended range, the reason why I needed that was for the Icarus flights. And there's, there's a big market for that because you can now use a sport category class machine 
for cross-country flying. You see how he solved the problem of high fuel consumption by making a larger fuel tank. All right. So again, you know, this is, it's, 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 it's very rational. It's not something that's necessarily negative. Why is it not a negative point? It's, there's pros and cons. You've got very good power to weight ratio. You've got a very simple, simplified engine that's got, there's a lot less things can go wrong with it. Uh, and as far as electronics and computers and things, it's not on this specific machine. The negative side is that you have high fuel consumption because you, it's an engine that you can run harder. It's a smaller engine. So you're running it harder. Um, you, 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 you're carrying more equipment and if you're flying something like the Icarus or the Wingman Challenge, you're running the engine harder, it's a bit more sensitive, um, so now you have an increased fuel consumption and you, you, you counter that by carrying more fuel. Um, now, the reason why I classify this machine as a sport class machine and the Nirvana as a cross country is because the, the, the inspiration behind this specific machine was for cross country flying. Um, and this one was for general purpose. It's a client machine that can jack it. It's not a multi-tool. Again, it's a sport class machine that you can solve the issues to make it a cross-country machine. It's important to talk about cross-country weight if you're talking about this. If you want this machine, I'm going to use an example here. If you want to fly 3.8 hours with this machine, you're going to fill it up to 25 liters of fuel because you're flying at the fastest speed possible. Um, let's call it full trim speed. You're going to get something between, and I'm giving a very generous figure here of 6.5 liters an hour. You can go above 10 liters an hour. But at 6.5 liters an hour, and, and I haven't seen one of those figures on the speed run cup, for example, where it's burning 6.5. So mostly it's going to be more than that. But at 25 liters, at 6.5 liters an hour, you're going to get 3.8 hours in this tank. If you weigh this, and I'll put some images on that, where I take my body weight, put this machine, lift, fill it up to 25 liters and stand on a scale, it comes in at 135 kilos for cross-country flying. All right, so off to the scale. This uh, Maverick does not have a reserve chute on, so I'm just going to hold a standard 130 a uh, kilo reserve, I'm putting the scale down, because everything is being fried in the sun, it's incredibly hot. Okay, oh, okay, make sure it's accurate. Oh, okay. okay, here we go. And 34.8. All right, let's check that out. Hundred and thirty four point four, hundred and thirty five, hundred and thirty five point four. Okay, keeping it as is. Let's do the Nirvana, and then see where we end. Okay, no, this is not something that you're going to be do for general purpose flying. Who flies with a twenty five liters fuel tank? A fuel tank um, for two hours. Nobody's going to do that. All right, so that's the negative thing is, is how your weight increases because you're carrying more fuel because you have a higher fuel consumption. The heavier you are, the harder you run your engine, the higher your fuel consumption becomes. The heavier you become, the, the, the harder you run your engine, the more fuel you burn. So it just becomes a, a very, you know, just keeps on going on its own. Um, all right, that's all I'm going to be saying about the Viterazzi. I had a very enjoyable experience flying and I think it's a very comfortable engine. I think it's a very comfortable unit. And... Um, uh, some of the other comments I made, I did in the air, so we'll, I'll refer to that video. All right, let's move over to this side. So the machine I have here behind me is the Nirvana F200 Cross Country. This machine was purposefully built for cross country flying, and therefore you've got high hang points um, that's on the harness specifically, and you don't have swing arms. However, you can get this machine to have swing arms. This one is actually already prepared for swing arms. And with swing arms, you have a sport machine like the, 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 the Parajet over there. All right, so what's important about this specific machine is, is that you'll see that with this strap making this 90 degrees here and the machine being hooked up to a much looser combination of hook-in points, 
and the same height, almost I would say just a little bit, tiny little bit higher than the Parajet, you have something that is much more comfortable for cross-country flying, much more stable. So pros and cons, you get stability, you lose weight shift. So this is not a very good weight shift machine. You can, if you put the swing arms in and you fly it like that, Again, you're going to have pros and cons. With swing arms, less comfortable for cross-country flying, but more comfortable for, um, for weight shifting, more effective with weight shifting. Um, I'm not going to get into the elements of the Nirvana, all the specific things, because I'm going to do a full review on this specific machine. I think I've owed that to all the Nirvana fans for a long time now. I've only did a five-minute review, and um, I think it's kind of time to get that done, and I'll do it in about a week's time when I do the 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 first speedrun cup race for the specific here. What I want to say is, is that this has got a, um, I'm going to turn this into the sun, and I just want to mention the pros and cons of this design. You've got the machine standing on its fuel tank. It doesn't have a frame that is as solid as the Parajet, and there's pros and cons to it. Nirvana's seeing of this is that it's got a collapsible zone, that if you hit the ground, the tank flexes and there's less stress on your back, um, and it's easy to replace. These parts are very cheap. So the price of parts is kind of important in paramotoring. If you do have a small accident or incident, then replacement of these parts you know, you don't want it. You don't doesn't want. You don't want it to cost a fortune. These aluminium struts are like 38 US dollars, so they're cheap. We went over to aircraft grade aluminium specifically because they a lot cheaper. If you break the TPs, that's more expensive. But if you're going to have to replace a bent titanium, which is very harder to to damage the the Parajet one, um, it's going to be more expensive. But we switched over to this instead of the, for example, Scout that still got the 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 carbon twist on the on the latest machines. We changed our system to have aluminium frames because they're cheaper to replace and we do have anti-torque, but yeah, that's a long story. We'll get into that at some point. Um, okay, so what else is here is that the positioning of the engine, You, if you do prime, we actually, I want to mention it in this specific video. If you prime the engine, you want to actually over prime the engine because you're pushing all the air out and you see how the fuel escape. That gives you an easy start, just simply because the air is out of the system, now you flip the electric start, the engine starts. Now if you don't do that correctly, then you're going to have a machine that doesn't start well. This one is only electric start, you're going to get about, you're going to get more than 500 kilometers of range on a battery like this. This engine is purposefully designed for cross-country flying. Why do I say that? Because fuel consumption was the priority, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video. So this machine, if you're flying at the full trim speed of the of the the um, the warp two, is going to produce 3.5 to 3.7 liters an hour. So therefore, it burns pretty much half what anybody else is currently producing or burning um, when it comes to fuel consumption. Um, therefore, you load less fuel. 10 liters in the main tank, up to 8 liters in the reserve bladder up the top, which you can use for camping gear or an extra fuel bladder that goes into that and gets connected to your tank. So, you see how the cross-country weight has decreased. This is a machine that weighs around the same as the Parage, around 24 kilos. You can get it lighter, but I'm talking specifically about this cross-country machine, it might even be one kilo heavier than the Parajet, 24 kilos. So that Parajet will not be weighing 24 kilos because it's got electric start and everything else. So that's, you know, you can assume it's about 25 to 26 kilos. So I would say these two are comparable weights. However, if I was to prepare this machine for 3.8 hours, like the Parajet there, I mentioned the 25 liters required, I'd only need 13 liters of fuel. So I'm showing you the video of what this machine weighs with only 13 liters of fuel. Walking up to the plate, got a reserve chute. Oh, oh, I've got to close the fuel tank and step it on. There we go, let's have a look. 121.4, big difference because it's only going to come in at 122 kilos. That one comes in at 135 kilos when you prepare for that flight distance. And it becomes worse when you are extending that even further. If I fully load this machine, it's going to give me five and a half to six, almost six hours of range 
to at full trim speed, which is a lot of distance that you could cover on this uh, as a cross country machine. So you can see the newer technology engine and the purpose for the inspiration the owner and the designers had to build this specific machine to be meant for a specific purpose. Now a lot of guys can say, but it's about price. This is at 14,000 and more that you're going to be paying for this machine. Well, the Parajet has the advantage of being a lot cheaper at starting at 8,000. But if you look at a machine that's comparable to performance with power to weight, you look at the factory R machine that, well, they, you know, the, the best information I can get, it still produces 25 horsepower, but it's got a better power to weight ratio, a ratio of 21.5 kilograms. I actually think that the factory R produces more power than that. It's supposed to produce something like 29 horsepower. I think that the web information might be incorrect. All right, so improving the power to weight ratio, like something on the factory R, that gives you a much more enjoyable experience as far as the sport flying machine goes. You lose elements like the electric start not being available, but pull start is still, it's great on that machine. So I really don't see the problem at all. There are reasons why I would say I prefer electric start, but I'm not going to get into it because the video is just going to get too long. Um, so the, the overall cross-country weight is something different than what you're going to be getting when you are doing um, just general sport flying because you don't really care that much of what your fuel consumption is for sport flying. And I think I've made my point now on what the differences are between a cross-country machine and a dedicated sport flying machine. Um, when we talk about the prices again, the, the nice thing about the Parajet is that you're going to start on that same platform uh, on the most basic models you're going to be somewhere above $8,000 that you're going to be paying for that whereas the Nirvana starts at this specific model starts at $14,000 and the, something like the Radio, the Rodeo which is our entry level machine that competes with the, the, the Maverick uh, is a, actually an entry level cross country machine so they're not really they're not really in competition. We haven't been in competition for a very long time, if you ask me. Um, we're just making the different inspirations and for different reasons. But if you're going to go for the factory R unit on the Parajet, you're going to pay more than $13,000 for it. So $13,000, $13,250 or somewhere around there, if you had to compare prices in the in California region, you have to put apples with apples. So that is what you'll be looking at paying for. Um, and if you had to add the elements on the Parajet that the Nirvana comes standard with, you'll get to a very close price. You see, this machine comes specifically with instruments. A, a head temperature, exhaust gas temperature, you've got a computerized unit that gives you all that information. Um, you've got a very, very different um, uh, engine design to what you'll get from a factory R. But like I said, why that's not an issue is because the factory are just made for an absolutely fantastic sport machine design. Whereas this needs all those instruments and all those gadgets and it makes it more expensive because it was built for a different reason altogether. So when somebody tells you that these two machines, you know, that machine can do exactly what this machine does, yes, they can both fly. But that's like saying buy any car because they can both drive. See what I mean? They're very different. Same, same. But different <laughs> anyway guys i hope you enjoyed the video i'm putting in some um some footage of me flying both machines Now you have these offset points as mentioned and these being at different positions kind of compensates for torque. So if I go to a higher RPM level it initiates a right leaning turn which is very common for machines that have a bit of a torque effect in it. Now let's go open up a little counter trim to see how much counter trim is required to get it to fly straight. Bring a higher RPM. Yeah, still a little bit. 
there we go. Now obviously you can play with these hook end points to make sure that you try to eliminate that as much as possible. Alright, next thing is weight shift. Let's see how it does with the weight shifting. The hold it like this. And weight shifting is pretty much initiating a turn by leaning in your seat. And that is what sport flying pilots really do like. Have a look at the feedback I'm getting from the wing. Because I'm flying in a prefrontal uh, with a with setup coming blowing in. You can see that whatever the wing is doing translates into the swing arms, the swing arms, then it's connected to the machine. So you've got this twisting motion that you've got to cater for. So it's less, co it, the harness is incredibly comfortable, very comfortable. I'm not having a bad experience flying this at all. More, see more movement on the risers. If I get off the ground a little bit easier. It's pretty crappy conditions. And so let's have a look at the anti-torque effect. A bit of an oscillation now. Just get this out because of the gusts, wind gusts, I think that's stable. Hands away. And going on to full power. It's a little bit of oscillation. I think that is more to do with the weather conditions, but... Uh, I don't have a right leaning moment, the machine isn't turning or leaning to the right. Here's the big difference, you've got a good anti-torque system and you drop these trimmers. You need a lot more RPM. You need a lot more RPM to stabilize that, so just a little bit of See, I don't have I don't need to counter the, the torque with the uh, with a higher RPM I'm using. I'm basically, uh, the aerodynamic fins, or the anti-torque fins, are helping me to fly in a straight line and I have less of an anti-torque uh, or, or, uh, anti trimming required. Uh, the weight shifting, lean over. Not that much. <laughs> I move a little bit, but really not that much. Because, as you can see, I cannot really lean over and shift my center of gravity because of these, because of these, uh, these straps over here. You don't have those straps on the parajet. The parajet comes up from the swing arms, and if you've got that bit of a motion, but these straps take that out. They eliminate that. Okay, I'm going to bring it in for landing. No matter what machine you fly, take pride in it. If it's a Polini 202, if it's an Atom 80, if it's a Nirvana, if it's a Parajet, love your machine, come to the school, do your instruction where the instructor is, and make sure that you get airborne because our ultimate goal is to grow the sport and not fill it with negativity. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and I'll be seeing you on the next one.